from family events to volunteer opportunities to community happenings, there is a lot going on in your community. Learn about all the possibilities and opportunities on this episode of Community Hotline. Hi and welcome to Community Hotline. My name is Monica Weitzel and we're here at Metro East Community Media in Gresham, Oregon. Thanks for joining us tonight. With me tonight, we're going to be talking with the Red Lodge Transition Services. And representing Red Lodge, we have Trish Jordan. Trish is the Executive Director of Red Lodge Transition Services. And Tana Sanchez, Sanchez who is a board member. Welcome both of you. Thanks for being here. Um, could somebody tell me a little bit, if you would, uh, about Red Lodge, exactly what it is you do and what the mission is of the organization? Well, uh, the mission of the organization is to reduce and prevent recidivism and incarceration among Native American people. And the way the, the organization was created, it, we are grassroots. We were working in the prisons as Native American Religious Service pro Program people, and we just continue to see the cycling. Same things over and over. Over and over, and over mm -hmm. the same people mm -hmm. coming back, people telling us, I don't know what we're going to do when we get out. We don't have housing, we don't it's have a scary skills. Thing. It's mm -hmm. terribly scary. Yeah. And so, you know, here we are. We have degrees. Some of us are running our own programs, and we're like, well, we can. We can do better than this, yeah. you know, and nobody's going to do it for us. And so we actually founded the organization with a small core group of Native American religious service people, and then we started bringing in community, and it's just kind of grown. Uh, in 2007, we received our 501c3. Right, right. So have you been with it since the beginning? Yes. How about you, Tana? Pretty yeah, close. Pretty yeah, close. she kind of dragged me kicking and screaming yeah. <laughs> on some of them because I, I work other programs, but I do work in social services, oh, okay. which, you know, sort of it really does fit right, and it really is a part of the overall mission of of the, of the program. And so. so, do you feel like before you were just kind of putting a band-aid on a problem, and now you're actually maybe getting to where you can make a, a bigger difference, where it's it's not just a band-aid; you're getting to some of the core issues of why people return to the prison system. Well, as volunteers in the religious services, it wasn't so much a band-aid. We were sort of helping people kind of get to their place, but or thinking about, you know, how do I do the, my life a little bit differently? Mm -hmm. But, but in reality, the the barriers were there the minute they hit the gate. I mean, you know. So you could mentally, maybe, and emotionally, spiritually help them get to the place where they needed to be. But if there wasn't help once they got out, exactly, then, then it's all exactly. For and and I mean, we have built a society where that is very very difficult mm -hmm. for people. Mm -hmm. If you have a felony on your record, you can't get an apartment. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. really difficult to do that. Finding a job is really you difficult. A lot of things. Yeah, a lot of these different, just everyday life. You you continue to pay for whatever it is, whatever crime you did. You continue to pay for it once you leave prison. Long past your exactly. the time you've actually served. Here. Exactly. So, uh, is this for both men and women? Well, it is mostly women. Mostly women. Okay. When we started the program and we started looking at what was involved, it's so huge. And That's so kind of we're like, okay, now we really need to look at the capacity of this program and, and where is it that we start? And we all agreed we need to start with the women. Okay. The women have less resources available to them. Uh, they usually have less family. Mm -hmm. um, many of them have children. Right, right. And the women are the backbone of our nation. You know, we really, uh, we've, most of our volunteers are women. And so it just seemed like a natural thing. We do support the men's prisons uh, with their annual events. We help with um, bringing in art supplies and other necessary uh, cultural programming. Sure. But the majority of our, our time and resources are devoted to the women. Yeah, you talked about the cycle, about how there's you know, this cycle that's perpetuated when people keep going back. Uh, a lot of these women, are probably victims themselves, not you know, of other crimes. Would okay. that be a correct assumption? Definitely. Um, I don't remember. I never remember the numbers. But what I know from years and years of working here is the majority of the women that we worked with, 
in the prison system have either been victims of domestic violence or sexual assault or child sexual abuse and or they often are in you know doing a crime with a male counterpart mm. and they tend to receive more more time unfortunately mm. on, and on particular crimes and of course what's the interesting about that is it is a kind of a societal norm that good women don't do this kind of thing or whatever it is that you know we think and and that's you know ends up women having a, a tougher time at this well the, the stigma of it is probably it's a huge, huge stigma huge can you speak to um, the difference between Native American women and the general population as far as, as um, numbers? Is there, it seems to me that I read somewhere that, the, um, that they are incar that Native American women are incarcerated at a higher rate, which, you know, and that, the vi that as victims, they have a higher rate of being assaulted and, and abused, and, and not necessarily from Native American men, but from any, any Usually race. the abuse happens from non-Native Is that right? Men. And we do have the highest number of, of rape than any other um, race. Um, the women are five to seven percent of the population at Coffee Creek, yet we're only one percent, one point seven percent of the Oregon population. Really? Wow. So, so it's, that it's, disparity yeah. figure is huge. Yeah. The men yeah. are four to five percent of the prison population. So actually, the women outpace the men as far as a ratio numbers, yeah. and and it's growing. So this is a really huge thing to overcome. Right. I mean, how do you do it? How what what kinds of things do you do to help these women transition back into society? Well, first we start working with them um, in the cultural sense. Okay. And bringing the culture in, uh, the sweat lodge, the smudge, many of them have never experienced that. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of them, it's like this light bulb goes off upstairs. It's like, wow, this is what I've been missing. This is what's going to keep me clean and sober. Yeah. This is what's you know oh, going to okay. feed my spirit. And so we're giving them tools that they need to create a foundation upon which to build. It's a connection to the to your community, right. you know, and and I would imagine and there's identity. a lot of support in that. Yeah, you yeah. know, many of them just seem to not have a lot of identity, and so bringing this in, even when they've come from the reservation, they've been removed from ceremony because of the alcohol and the drugs right. that have right. been involved in their family circles. So it, it's really important that work. But then we also bring in. Um, programs such as uh, dealing with historical trauma, um, uh, domestic violence, um, the spirit of alcohol. Um, what else have we done? Well, we do, the, we do of course, bring in other ceremony pieces from, from um, well, the Warm Springs come, uh, tribe comes in, some of them, and, and bring in the, the wash it ceremony. But a lot of those, those, those classes or group pieces that we're talking about are stuff that really, you know, I want to address that, the, the historical trauma piece, because we're dealing with stuff that's really, really old. And, you know, things that happened generations back in the boarding school era and where people were traumatized. And so that's what you're talking about when you say historical trauma. Well, it's yes. not just history of that person's life. It's, it, oh, exactly. it's generations yes. back. Generations back, okay. because, because, I mean, if you think about it, if a child in the late 1800s, early 1900s was taken away from their family at age five or six, they were removed completely from their people, put into a boarding school, had their hair mm. cut off, mm. all of their clothes taken away from them, they were given, uh, and all you their know. cultural complete, identity wiped out, I Exactly. Yeah. We're not allowed to speak their language, we're not allowed to oh. practice their culture in any way, shape, or form, and we're given an, entire dif an entirely different language and religion or spirituality to practice and abused in some way, shape, or form if they didn't comply with those things. If you think about it, what's a child to think about who they are as a person yeah. and, and how they move forward? And through that, those boarding school eras that not everybody experienced, but a lot of our, our nations did experience, if we come down generationally in that, if all of you, how you learn to be a to be a companion, to be a parent, to be in a relationship with other people was in some way, shape, or form abusive. 
It's passed you know? down, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It's yeah. generationally exactly. passed yeah, down. Exactly. So we have to address that. And as I said, not everyone experienced that, but a lot of people did. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were able to sort of come away from that and think, I'm never going to let that happen. But a lot of people were seriously damaged by those issues. Mm -hmm. And that's where we end up with things like alcohol and or drugs, you right. know, as we move further into, right. you know, sort of that generational trauma. Those things, those things have occurred. And also, I like to address that too because I think that it's really important to recognize that not everybody drinks or uses sure, drugs in our course. native communities. Yeah. There are a lot of people who are, you know, been clean and sober forever, or just really recognize that this is not something that's going to work right. for our communities. Right. So, but it does happen. It mm -hmm. is there. It's, it is issues that we have to to think about and look at, and and long-term issues of racism and oppression are are there, have been there, mm -hmm. and are still, you know, they're continuing. They're, they're on, so often. Yeah, yeah, they surely are. Do you feel well, like you're making a difference? Do you, can we you know see we're it? making a difference. Tell, tell me, give me an example of, of some people well, that you've worked with that may have been changed. For instance, we actually created a class for our women on the high, uh, that we consider high risk on the medium unit at Coffee Creek. There's a minimum and a medium unit. We had three women a year and a half ago who hung themselves at Coffee oh. Creek and a fourth that didn't follow through. That's a crisis. Yeah. And when we started talking with, with the, the women and other people within the institution, we realized that it wasn't just three women, it was maybe 20 women that had either cut on themselves or tried to take too many mm. pills. They just all and, weren't successful at ending their lives. Yeah, but and, and so, you know, what can we do to help these women? And so one of our board members is working on her PhD. She actually created the curriculum. And we went in for 12 weeks every Monday and we brought special guest speakers in and we started working with them. And, and we call it peeling, the, peeling back the onion. You know, yeah, we're starting layers, to yeah. get, and, and these women know this, they trust us. And so they're telling us, you know, um, these are women that, that spend a lot of time in the segregation unit or they, they, they're back and forth between the behavioral unit and the general population. And they're like, you know what, we're, we, feel, we feel like we belong. We, we, we love it when you come in and um, we're going to listen, oh, you know. And, and so even the counselors and the chaplain came up to us and said, we're seeing a real change in these oh, that's women. that's great. How rewarding, too, to get that. Right. Now, I think you brought a few pictures of some of the women that you've worked with, so maybe we can get take a look at some of those pictures and you can tell us if, this, if these were taken at the, at the prison or, or where they are. Coming up here in a second. Okay, what are we looking at here? Uh, I think oh, I this recognize This is out them. in the yard. Um, this is minimum. That's the minimum, minimum unit, yeah. And this at Coffee Creek? Mm -hmm. Yes. Where is that located? Is that? Wilsonville. Wilsonville, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, and you know, that's one of those great things about this, just to be able to be with people and communicate. I mean, these women are, are um, in different units uh -huh. uh, in the prison, and they don't always see each other. Oh, so they get this so chance they, to actually socialize yes. and, and look to each other. Mm -hmm. And this one, I believe, was on the medium unit when we did one of the spring celebrations when I talked about the Warm Springs people coming in. and. And we bring in lots of our shawls, as you know, mm -hmm. traditional dance shawls Beautiful. and things, so that you know, just for a minute, you can be a part of who you are, your community again, and cover up the little orange stamp on your oh, jeans yeah. and your yeah. t-shirt, and be like everybody. And else. be like everybody yeah. else. Yeah, yeah. and that's important. We've tried to convince them to let us bring wing dresses in. We haven't gotten there oh. yet. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Okay, and tell me about is, this person. Yeah, this is Ed Edmo. Ed Edmo is one of our board members, and he <laughs> is very passionate about what we're doing. He he goes to Coffee Creek with me to run the high risk classes for the women, and and um, he is a traditional storyteller. And this is Grandmother Chokecherry. <sighs> You tell him he looks great in lipstick. Yeah, <laughs> he's got he's got a dress and nylons on too oh there that goodness. you can't How see. Cute is that? But he's uh, he's quite the character. Ed um, did spend some time in prison. He um, so he vandalized a church, and he'll oh. tell people don't ever don't ever vandalize a church. They'll throw the book at you. Wow. And uh, good to know. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
And so these are... Uh, and this is, yeah, we're eating the sacred foods. We bring in the sacred foods and we set the table just like they do at the longhouse. And, um, you know, we got to have the fry bread. And so mm, like yeah. when... The add on, it's yeah. Just, it, it's just a fabulous day. They're just euphoric. They wait all year for this. And it's coming up again. May 4th, we'll have spring celebration. And this is a big group. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is yeah, this is the whole of them that were there, and it just just again be able to visit and, yeah. and you know take a picture and connect you know, with connect other with people. other people. Yeah, yeah it's right. very difficult sometimes. Tell me a little more about the spring celebration. What what is that about? Now you say you bring in the traditional foods, and is is this a spiritual it, ceremony or what exactly is it? Well, it is. Yes, um, we in the morning we'll be over on the minimum unit. And um, several of us come in, and we're, of course, the, the Warm Springs people bring in their drums, and it's a ceremony that they do there. It's called the wash it. But it really is about uh, honoring and recognizing the sacred foods that we get to eat on a regular basis, hopefully, but they don't get to eat in prison, right? All right. Oh, so yeah. they don't get the salmon, they don't oh, get yeah. the huckleberries or deer meat or our roots or all those right. <laughs> Sounds all those wonderful. wonderful things. <laughs> right. They don't be. They're not able to get those things so on a regular basis. So you're able to bring it in during that celebration? We are. It took me four years to get the sacred foods into the prison. When, when I first started working with women in prison over 13 years ago, I said to the chaplain, I said, you know, these women are starving. They're starving spiritually, and we need to bring our spiritual food in and feed these women. And the chaplain said, it'll never happen. Really? But you made it happen. Well, of course I did. <laughs> because you know, you're a you just, woman, aren't you? You just do what you need to do. And it was very, very important. And it's made a huge difference in their life. Um, yeah. It's a lot more than just eating better food than they usually get. There's, exactly. It's, it's well, spiritual it's, it's spiritual food. You know, it, it, isn't, it isn't like a huge amount of food. It's spiritual food. And this, this food has been prayed for before they ever even go out to to gather this food, their ceremony that goes on before they ever, you know, and it's such an honor to be able to gather the foods. So there's a huge, huge um, piece of it before the food even gets to the prison. And last year we took some of our women out and we actually dug roots. So nice. they had that experience. And that was part of the meal? Okay. Yeah. Women who have exited the prison. <laughs> oh, okay. <Yeah. laughs> they were out of the prison yard. Yeah, they, the didn't let, they yeah. didn't let them out yeah. for the day. Yeah. No, they no, didn't. We'd, we'd taken some women who had already, you know, left the prison and are doing well and, like, basically making it out here finally. And they got to go dig some of those roots, which was really an amazing yeah. thing. The culture is very uh, rich in tradition. Oh, it? yes, very yeah. much so. And, and symbolism and spiritualism, it's, it's very rich. Um, so... You work with the women in the prisons, and then when they come out, what's there for them? How are you, you were able to continue to support them after they yeah. come out of prison? Well, one of the first things that's really important to that whole process is just picking them up. Oh, just having somebody there to... Right. to right. Some people don't even have oh, anybody to pick that. them up, and oh, I've sad. picked up plenty of people from the gate. They don't have clothes, so we have a clothing closet at the Wilshire Native American Fellowship Church, and so we can get them clothing. Um, we provide them mentoring. We oh, just okay. get them through that first day. A lot of it's so overwhelming. You yeah. go from making yeah. 30 choices to over 300 choices, which we're all used. We all multitask. Right. It's we don't so, think about how right. the yeah. the stimulation is so overwhelming that a lot of times by the end of the day they're crying. These women, how how long? Would they have been in prison anywhere from like a couple months to a couple of years, a few years? What? No, they have to be in at least a year to go to prison. Okay. Otherwise, they do their time I don't in know jail. All the details. Yeah. Okay, okay. And so they've and been in there a while. Yeah. A lot of them have had long sentences because of Measure 11. Mm -hmm. um, one of our women that recently released, she did 15 and a half years. And she is doing fabulous. Really? Oh, yes, yeah. so great to hear. And and is she involved with uh, your organization with the Trans Red Lodge? I mean, does she? Do people come back and, and volunteer and mentor? Is that they do. They want to, and they tell us before they ever get out. You know, I'm. I'll be there. You know, I want to be a part of this. They want to be a part of community. 
when you've been running really fast and you've been doing what you're not supposed to be doing, you've got to kind of <coughs> create your whole life over again. Yeah, and that, yeah. that includes the people in your life. Right. Um, <coughs> you know, your, your associates are you a big part of, of, you know, why you, you went to prison. And so um, one of our women that, ha that did 15 and a half years, she was fortunate to be able to go to her sister's um, out in Hillsboro. But she said, you know, if my mom didn't work and couldn't get me into town and couldn't do this and couldn't do that, I don't know what I would do. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And it, it would be so easy to slip back into what you knew before, what was comfortable. Mm -hmm. And she, this is a, that's a huge, a huge thing to yeah. have to transition into, into regular society. Yeah, right. And, and she actually said, you know, I went and visited some of those old people uh -huh. and they're still doing the same thing they we were doing fifteen <clears throat> years ago. And now she's she's realized even though I love and care about those people, I can't have anything to right. do with them. Get them out of your life, yeah. What were you gonna say, Tommy? Oh, I don't know, I lost yeah. it in the sort of, their throat's a little crunchy today. So, <clears throat> tell me about um how how are you supported? How, how does how, and and do you have a, a staff that runs this program? I mean, you're obviously the staff, but I mean, is it a is it a paid staff? Is it a volunteer program? What tell me, no. tell me some details on that? Mm -mm. None of us get paid for what we do. It is a labor of love, and I am a registered nurse by trade. I work 25 hours a week usually uh -oh. to pay my bills, and then I work about 30 hours a week on Red Lodge. Okay. And so, and you have, you have a, a, is it a fundraiser that's coming up? We do, okay. we do, and it's going to be a great night. Okay, and this is the uh, Little Spring Moon Gala. Yes. Correct? Okay, and this is at the PSU Native Center, which I know there's a lot of activities going on there all the time. Right, right. Um, we have some <coughs> pictures. Now, there, is this art that's going to be auctioned off, or what is it? Is it the art that we're going to be looking at, and I would like them to bring it up on the screen so we can talk about that. What, what is the artwork that we'll be looking at? We have, this is the Friends, this is the Friends of Red Lodge artwork. Okay. Friends of Red Lodge is emerging between mm. prison artwork and community artwork. And all of the artwork that is donated to Red Lodge goes into the Women's Transition House Fund. Since 2008, we've been um, being, you know, we've, we've got donated art in and we've been using it to one, tell a story. We do a lot of uh, public events with the art. And two, um, to try and, and create a sustainability program for our women. So all of the artwork that we've received that we, um, we sell, we make it into cards and prints and, oh, okay. and uh, calendars. Um, that goes directly into the Women's Transition House Fund. Okay. And then we have other ways that we have other fundraiser pieces, but we've raised almost thirty thousand dollars nice. toward From, this house. Wow! That's great. So mm -hmm. the gala that we're having this Friday mm -hmm. at the Native Center, um, there will be several pieces of this art there. Uh, we have a silent auction. We have several pieces of art that have been donated. Uh, some of them um, community artists. Some of them are uh, prison artists. Wow. There's some fabulous work and here. There really <laughs> is some fabulous it's art. Gorgeous. It's going to be a great evening. We've got Cody Blackbird that's coming. He's an internationally acclaimed flute player, oh. Native American Music Awards um, flute player. And uh, so he'll be performing. Ed, Ed Moe is going to be doing Grandma Choke Cherry. <laughs> We've got the fun. silent auction. Uh, is there a meal involved dinner. with this or hors d'oeuvres? Chef Laura Booth is, <laughs> is making us uh, salmon mm. on a cedar plank, oh, salmon. Uh, it's going to be a great fabulous. evening. So this is taking place on March 29th from yes. 6.30 to 10 p.m. at PSU Native Center, which I show as 710 Southwest Jackson in uh, Portland. Right. So right, right up by Portland State, right? Right. right. You can yeah. check the website for the... Uh, um, the ability to get tickets and okay. that kind of thing to get some information Good. about it. Red Lodge Transition. Yeah, so the, so the website is redlodgetransition.org. Mm -hmm. And um, it sounds like it's going to be a great night. And I love the artwork. It's gonna, it'll be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're just about out of time. Is there any last thing you want to say in parting about, about your organization or, or uh, about what you're doing? You got it covered? Well, I do want to mention that the art is 
it's a labor of love for those people who are in prison who are doing some of the art pieces and some of them are done in such amazing and detailed ways a lot of it is pencil art a lot of it is pen ink ink pens sometimes some of the watercolors that we've had in the past are literally the little watercolor oh, wow. pieces really? like, because that's what they can get. Oh my goodness. So, you know, some of the woodwork that we've gotten out of, you know, that the, some of the prisoners have given us over the years, it's done from all these tiny little pieces of wood that are actually glued together and oh. created different kind of sculpture pieces. I mean, so they, it is. They, do, it is. Yeah. They, yeah. they make this art with whatever they can get and it's right. really amazing. Some of it is just stunning to look at and I hope people will come and take a I look at some of the beautiful pieces that we'll have. Thank you so much both of you Tana and Trish for being here tonight and I hope that people will um, pay attention and go ahead and, and check out the the auction and the gala it sounds like it'll be a great uh, event and if people are interested in volunteering donating uh, money to your organization finding out ways to help they can go to uh, redlodgetransition.org Yes, thank you. Yes, you bet. And thanks for watching this edition of Community Hotline. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll see you back here next week. I'm Monica Weitzel. This is Community Hotline. KZME Radio is a new station that is committed to entertain, inspire, and connect our community through programming that celebrates local music, arts, and culture. It was created to put local music and local arts on local radio, and it is a vehicle for our creative community to gain exposure while also celebrating what the Portland metro area has to offer. Hey folks, I'm Mike Midlow from the band Pancake Breakfast. What's so cool about KZME? Well, it's local music. You know, you can't go to every live show. Believe me, I've tried. So you could tune into KZME and hear a bunch of music that you might not get to see otherwise. Why should you support KZME? Well, it's pretty obvious. I mean, if you like Portland Town, USA, homegrown music, independent radio, and if you believe in the powers of rock and roll, then contribute to KZME. It's music where you live. My favorite thing about community media is how people find their voice and tell their story. It's the message of, by, and for a community. We're a gathering place because it gets people of all sorts of different backgrounds underneath one roof. It's art, it's technology. A snapshot of our community. Going live in three, two, one.
The League of Women Voters makes history. Our country would not be the same without their dedication. Formed by women who organized to win women the right to vote. It is now a co-ed organization. Studying, informing, and acting. Nonpartisan. Grassroots. Influential. Taking political stands on many issues. The League of Women Voters encourages all citizens to be informed and active in government. Join, Join the, the League, League of Women, women Voters of East Multnomah County, County in, in making history, history today. today.